In this video, we're going to return to the idea of quotienting a space by a group action. And we're going to see what that's got to do with the theory of covering spaces. So remember that we say a group acts continuously on a space X if, which I'm going to write as, if for each G and G there exists a map uh, rho G to x which is a homeomorphism and we need this to uh, satisfy a bunch of conditions so we need rho gh to be the composition of rho g and rho h and we want the identity to act as the identity Okay, so this is what a continuous group action is. Um, and remember, the quotient x over g is the set of equivalence classes where we consider x to be equivalent to rho g of x for all g and g. In other words, this is the orbit space of the group action. So what's this got to do with covering spaces? So suppose we have a continuous group action of G on X um, and suppose moreover suppose that For all x in x, there exists an open set u containing x such that u is disjoint from rho g of u for all g not equal to the identity. Okay, so this is a condition, it's an important condition which I'll highlight. Because what it allows us to deduce is that the quotient map from x to x over g is a covering space, or a covering map. So let me just give you an example of what I mean here. Here's the real line. And remember there's an action of the integers on the real line, which just translates by an integer amount in either direction. So this, I claim, satisfies this condition here because if I take a a point in here there's some small interval around that point which by energy any integer translation gets sent to a disjoint interval so this is like u this is maybe I'll, I'll write it as u plus one u plus two like translating u in a, by an integer amount in either direction okay so as long as that interval is sufficiently small um, it'll be disjoint from all its translates. So that tells us that the map from R to R mod Z is a covering map by this theorem. And this guy here is the circle, so this is exactly the map we've already seen that sends x to e to the i x. And I've just been blithely using the fact this is a covering map. So um, it'll, it'll follow from this theorem once, well, once I've proved that actually this is uh, a properly discontinuous group action. 
OK. So let's prove this theorem. Here's x. Here's x over g. Here's the quotient map. Let's take a point downstairs, which I'm going to write as the equivalence class of x. So x is going to be a pre-image under the quotient map. The uh, assumption that I have in the theorem is that upstairs in x, there's an open set whose translates under the group action, other than that of the identity, are disjoint from u. So there is some set u such that its translates under the group, group action are um, disjoint from it. Downstairs, I can take Q of U. Now let me call that V. Now, if you remember the video about the quotient topology, I think this was the third video about the quotient topology, I proved that the quotient map under a group action is an open map. So Q of U is an open set. This was by an earlier video. So V is an open set. Great. Q inverse of V, well you might look at this and think well that's U, but it's not. It's the set U together with all of its translates under the group action. And those are disjoint from one another. So this is the disjoint union over the elements in the group of rho g applied to u. So I guess this, maybe I'll draw this in uh, a red instead, because uh, that's this red set upstairs. It contains u, but it also contains some other stuff. To show that q is a covering map, what I need to prove is that Q inverse of V is homeomorphic to V times some discrete set. And moreover, I want the homeomorphism to be such that if I first project down from Q inverse of V to V using the map Q, that's the same as mapping along the homeomorphism to v times f and then projecting onto the first factor. So this picture I draw here commutes, as they say. OK, what's this discrete set going to be? Well, looking at this formula, you can kind of guess. Each of these guys, rho g u, is actually homeomorphic to v. So rho g, remember, is a homeomorphism, so it's homeomorphic to u. Apply rho g. And u is homeomorphic to v just via the map q. Right? q is this map, this quotient map. And v was the image of u under this quotient map. It's an open map, and it's bijective. So let me let me justify this statement. So Q restricted to U, going from U to V, is continuous. It's an open map. We proved that images of open sets are open. That means it, if it has an inverse, the inverse is continuous. It's surjective because V is defined to be the image of U under Q. And I claim it's also injective, which will then, all this together proves that it's a homeomorphism. It's injective because uh, if Q of uh, A equals Q 
here B for A and B in U, then, well, they lie in the same equivalence class. So rho G A equals B for some G. And that tells us that rho G U which contains this guy intersected with U which contains this guy is not empty so G has to be the identity so by this equation then A has to be equal to B that proves the injectivity okay so it's a bijection it's continuous and because it's an open map this means its inverse is also continuous So it's a homeomorphism. Right, so what are we saying? We're saying each of these rho g u's is homeomorphic to v. And q inverse of v is a disjoint union of sets like that. So I can map this to V times G because what I've just said is each of these sets is homeomorphic to V. So each of these sets is homeomorphic to V and there's one for each element of G. So um, let's see if I if I say a general point in this set here has the form rho g of little u for some little u in u. I'm going to map that to, well, I'm going to stick a g in the second factor and in the first factor I'm going to first map to u and then map to q of u. All right, that's in v by definition because v is q of capital U. So what I've just told you is that this map from rho g u to v is a homeomorphism. And now I'm saying if I take the disjoint union over elements of g on both sides, I st still get a homeomorphism. Moreover, if I project via q on this side and via projection to the first factor on this side, what do I get? So if I apply Q to rho G of U, well, Q takes the equivalence class into the group action, so rho G of U is equivalent to little u. So rho G U maps to Q of U. And on this side, projection to the first factor certainly gives Q of U. They agree, so this diagram connects. Okay, that proves that this quotient map here is a covering map if we have a group action satisfying this criterion. So this criterion has a name, it's called proper discontinuity of the group action. I don't like that name because it's a continuous group action and you're then calling it properly discontinuous, but you know that's what people call it. Um, but it's a really useful criterion. I want to give you um, a bunch of examples to which you can apply this theorem. So, in other words, a way of checking whether this red condition, this properly discontinuous condition, holds. Uh, so, theorem let X be a metric space. And suppose G acts. by isometries that is uh, distance preserving maps distance preserving homeomorphisms suppose moreover that there exists some constant C positive 
such that for all x in x and for all g not equal to the identity in the group um, the distance between x and its translate under the g action is at least c then the action is properly discontinuous So this example we saw right up here, translation by an integer, satisfies the hypotheses of this new theorem because uh, translation is an isometry, it preserves distances, and if I take a point and translate it an integer amount, it's always at least half away from where it started, or, or at least a millionth of a centimetre away from where it started because I'm translating by an integer amount. So there's some constant C such that this holds true. So proof. Pick a point. Around that point take the metric ball of radius R where R is well anything less than C over 2 anything positive less than c over 2. I claim this will do for proving proper discontinuity. In other words, br x intersect uh, rho g br x is empty if g is not the identity And that's because if we assume that it's not empty, then there is some point in between uh, containing both sets. Say why? So this is one of the balls, this is its image under the translation by G, there's some point Y in the overlap. That means the distance from x to y is less than r, which is less than c over 2, and the distance from rho g x to y is also less than r, which is less than c over 2. So the distance from x to rho g x is less than r plus r by the triangle inequality, that's less than c. That's a contradiction. Right, I assumed these distances are always bigger than C. Okay, so for example, the in integers acting on the real line by rho of n of x equals x plus n satisfies this condition because uh, d of x rho n x is the distance between x and x plus n which is well in this case it's equal to n and that's always bigger than let's say a half if n is bigger than zero if n is not equal to zero so n is an integer more generally you could take rn and zn acting by uh, oh, n hmm. let's, let's call the integer k1 up to kn acting on x1 up to xn this action is going to be x1 plus k1 dot 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 xn plus kn so again this is properly discontinuous because the dif distance between x uh, sorry distance between x and rho of k x, I'm just going to stop writing all the indices, is what is it? It's like square root of some x i plus k i uh, minus x i, so just k i squared, right, by Pythagoras. 
Pythagoras' theorem. So this is always bigger than or equal to, well, a half. Again. So again, th we can take this to be our constant. Just one more example, maybe, of a different flavor. If I take S n inside R n plus 1 to be the sphere of radius 1, and g to be the group z mod 2, then I have a z mod 2 action on the sphere where the identity acts as the identity and the non-trivial element acts as the antipodal map. The antipodal map is the one that sends x in the sphere to its opposite point, minus x. That's a homeomorphism of the sphere. And what is the distance on the surface of the sphere between x and minus x? Well, yeah, it depends. Do you want to give this the metric induced from Rn plus 1, or do you want to give it the metric induced by looking at spherical paths? If, if you look at the first one, the distance between x and minus x is 2, that is going through the centre of the Earth and out the other side. You just go down one and then down another one to get to the North Pole, the South Pole. Or if you're going along the surface of the Earth, then you, let's think, the uh, radius, so the, uh, sorry, the circumference of the circle is, is 2 pi, and we're going halfway around, so that's just pi. In either case, this is the constant. You, know, you want to take your constant to be smaller than this. So this could be uh, bigger than 1. So again, this group action um, is properly discontinuous, and you could take your constant to be equal to 1 to see that. Why is this a group action? How do I, how do I actually check that it's a group action? Well, I just need to check that if I do the antipodal map twice, I get back to the identity, right? That cyclic group of order 2, that's what it means. If I do the antipodal map twice, I'm multiplying by minus 1 twice, so I get back to the identity. Okay, so this gives me a covering map from the sphere to the sphere divided by a z mod 2 action. Now this quotient is a space called RPN. We may well have come across RP2. We may well have come across RPN, but you've probably come across RP2. Maybe I even talked about it in one of the other videos. Um, this is called the real projective space. The real projective N space. So it has a double cover by the sphere. In the next video, we're going to see that you can read off the fundamental group of a quotient like this if the space upstairs is simply connected. In particular, this will tell us the fundamental group of RPN is Z mod 2. It'll tell us the fundamental group of the N torus is Zn and the circle is Z. It's a really cool theorem.